So he is an astrophysicist at The Ohio State University, um, so my alma mater and current school as well. Um, Paul's also the, uh, he wears a lot of hats. He's also the Chief Science uh, Officer for COSI, and he has his own company called Astro Tours uh, that leads trips to places like the Atacama Desert and um, Iceland uh, to see auroras. Uh, so um, if you want to go on one of those, like, you know, uh, bucket list uh, tours, uh, Check out, what's your website? You go to astro.tours. 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 Cool. Um, I mean, yeah, this one that he, he said that uh, they just got back from the Atacama Desert, and um, they said one night you saw a cloud, right? It was miserable. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be the Milky Way. <laughs> So that, that, that is on my bucket list. It's, it's not number one, but it's, 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 it's up there. Um, and, um, and so Paul has uh, recently written a book, and um, uh, I understand he was going to bring some copies tonight, uh, but the publisher was late in getting him. Was still waiting for the, the next shipment of books. Okay. But you said that they could get signed copies? Yes, so after the talk there'll be a link with a coupon code where you can go to my website, order a book online, and you get a discount, and then as soon as the books come in, I'll ship them to you autographed. Awesome. So, anyway, um, so everybody, uh, thank you, Paul, for coming, and um, especially uh, through the ice and, and, and whatnot, so... Let's welcome Paul. Thank you. So I want to talk about change tonight. Has anyone in this room ever experienced change in your lives? Yeah. <laughs> if I show, you don't have to tell any stories or anything. It's just if I show, it's okay. So change is something that happens. Have you ever had, do you, re do you remember in your life a, a singular event? where your life was completely different after that event than it was before. <laughs> Do you remember being able to predict that event? No. Um, did you see that event coming? Partially. Partially? <laughs> did you see it coming like a month before? A year before? What about a decade before? No. What about slow changes? You know, are you a different person than you are, were a year ago? A little bit, a little bit. What about uh, 10 years ago? 20 years ago? What about 100 years ago? <laughs> you're a little bit different. You're a little bit different than you were 100 years ago, right? 100 years ago, you were just you know, carbon and oxygen atoms and trees and rocks and dirt and cows and stuff. And, but what about 100 years from now? Will you be a different person? Be right back there. Yeah, right back. <laughs> if you're thinking, wow, like, wow, this guy's getting pretty dark. <laughs> it's going to get worse. So funny. <laughs> Change defines our lives. Right? It's a part of our lives. It's not just a part of our lives. It's a part of the human experience. Right? Was, was the world a different place a hundred years ago? Or a thousand years ago? Or a hundred thousand years ago? It was different. It was different. And it was chaotic. And life is messy, and life is unpredictable. So is it any wonder that our ancestors would look up to the night sky for answers? Just how different is the, are the heavens compared to the earth? I think about it, like, the, the sun rises so dependably in the east every single day, we don't even think about it. Right? And it sets in the West. We don't even think about it. It's the same moon. All the time. It's the same constellations, the same stars, every single season. It's so regular, it's so accurate. You can, you can set a clock to it, literally. You can make a calendar out of it. It's so different than our experiences here on the Earth. And when you're confronted with a night sky like this, this beautiful dark sky that is so regular and so perfect, you start asking questions, 
right? I'm sure everyone in this room has asked questions in the night sky, right? Where do we fit in? Are we alone? What is the meaning of it all? Like, you start asking these really, really deep questions because obviously who's ever in charge of that has it figured out. They've got their stuff together. If it can be that regular and that dependable and that word. The heavens are so perfect. Well, what about the comets? Okay, just shut up about the comets, okay? If the heavens are perfect, I said it's totally dependable and orderly. No, it's so funny. It's so funny to, to see. It, I shouldn't say funny because, you know, we have to give ancient cultures their due. It's amusing to see how ancient cultures dealt with things like comets. How they tried to understand them. Of course, because, because comets are messy, right? They appear out of nowhere. They're really fuzzy. They look weird, and then they go away after a few weeks. You can't predict them. They're different every time. So different cultures across the world would, would notice comets because they're quite noticeable. And of course, most of the time, it was something divine. Like, oh, here comes a plague again. The gods have spoken. And if you're a little bit more uh, physically or naturalistic minded, you would look at something like a comet, and you would say, oh, of course, a comet is just an atmospheric <coughs> phenomenon. I don't know what it is, but it's something in the atmosphere. It doesn't belong to the heavens. Why? Because the heavens are perfect. We're the messy ones. We're the messy ones. And comets are messy. Comets belong to us. This was the prevailing view in Europe for centuries until 1577. In 1577, a great comet swung by, those visible from all around the world. In 1577 was a very particular time for a comet to visit Europe. Because in 1577, living in Copenhagen, there was an amazing astronomer by the name of Tycho Brahe. And of course, this great comet swing by, and everyone freaked out, but Tycho Brahe asked a question to this comet instead. He looked at this comet, this great comet that was visible in the sky, and he asked, how far away are you? How far away are you? So, it's kind of hard to measure things up in the sky, up in space, in the heavens, you can't exactly drag a ruler out or a tape measure or walk some pieces. But Tycho Brahe, being an amazing astronomer that he was, had some techniques, he had some tricks up his sleeve. And one trick that he used to measure a distance to a comet is, is actually really simple. It's actually really simple. I want everyone to hold their finger in front of their face. Just like this. <laughs> and if you're chuckling, you know where I'm going, right? <laughs> hold it nice and close, just a few inches away. Now I want you to close one eye and look past your finger up at me and waving to you, okay? Now, on the count of three, switch eyes. One, two, three, switch. Switch back and forth. Camera one, camera two. Camera one, camera two. What is your finger doing? It's wiggling relative to a distant background. Now, now extend your arm as far as it can go. Get that stretching. Your finger's not doing anything. It's your perspective. <laughs> it's appearing to smart of this. <laughs> Just do the same thing. Camera one, camera two. Camera one, camera two. What's your finger doing? It's less. It's way but a little bit less. Now I'm going to look at my finger way up here. Okay, camera one, camera two. Camera one, and I didn't have too much caffeine today, so I should be pretty <laughs> slow. <laughs> so you said. It's hard to move. It's hard to move, right? Is there a relationship? Distance is connected to the amount of wiggle. The closer something is, the more it wiggles. This is, this is trigonometry from two different vantage points. So Tycho Brahe was able to use this technique called parallax, by the way, which is already well known, to measure a distance in this comet. But he didn't use his eyes because, you know, that, that won't get you too far. So he had one eye in his observatory in Copenhagen, he had a bunny down in Prague to serve as the second eye. 
They measured, first they measured the moon, the position of the moon relative to the distant stars. Saw a little shift in the position of the moon, measured the distance of the moon. That was no surprise to anyone. But just to make sure that they, you know, they, they weren't doing this right. And then they measured the parallax, the amount of wiggle to this comet. And how much parallax did they measure? Let's see what? They didn't measure any parallax at all. What did that tell them? It wasn't in our atmosphere. It was atmosphere. It's further away than the moon. This comet, this strange visitor, this messy thing, didn't belong to the supposedly perfect heavens. It belonged to us. Or sorry, it didn't belong to us. It belonged to the supposedly perfect heavens. That was 1577. A few decades later, a few decades later, Galileo invented the astronomical telescope, and he went nuts. As you know, as you know, when you look at the sky through a telescope, it completely and totally changes character. How some things look or feel to the naked eye look totally different, feel totally different through a telescope. And the first person to ever experience that was Galileo. He looks at the moon, from with the naked eye, the moon looks like smooth, polished marble. To a telescope, to Galileo, it's rocks and craters and piles of junk. It was rough and coarse. <laughs> Venus, uh, oh, the morning star, right? Mm -hmm. Through a telescope, Venus has a phases. Jupiter. Jupiter has four little buddies that obviously orbit around it, change with time. And Saturn, don't even get me started on Saturn. Paraphrasing Galilee. <laughs> the night sky took on a completely different character when examined under his telescope. Totally different. Radically different. It looked messy. It looked chaotic. Looked unpredictable. He couldn't understand what he was seeing. So at this time, in the late 1500s and early 1600s, some thoughts began to bubble up. Some thoughts began to surface. Maybe, maybe, maybe our cosmology is wrong. Maybe our view of the heavens is wrong. Right? Maybe our view that we're here on the earth and we are messy and chaotic and dirty and sinful and we're surrounded by these perfect crystal spheres, each one carrying one of the celestial objects, gliding effortlessly against each other, creating the wheel of heavens every single night. And surrounding that is heaven itself. Absolute perfection at the edges with us being the messy, sinful center. But now the heavens were starting to look a little bit messy. Now the heavens were starting to look a little bit unpredictable. Maybe, maybe we're a part of the heavens too. Maybe the earth moves. Maybe the earth is a part of the heavens. Maybe the earth revolves around the sun. Maybe, maybe not. There was a major objection to this idea. An argument against this sun-centered universe idea. And that guy who raised this objection was none other than Tycho Brahe himself, the guy who figured out that comets belonged in the heavens. And his argument was this. He said, okay, let's assume for the sake of argument, so I can prove you wrong, that the earth revolves around the sun. Right? So here's the sun, I'm the earth, look at me, I'm orbiting, all right? Okay, it's winter time, now it's spring, now it's summer, you get the idea, right? What would happen if I look at a star, like right there, and I very, very accurately measure the position of that star, and I can, because I'm the world's greatest astronomer, according to myself. <laughs> and it's summertime, and it's summertime. Record the position of that star. And then I wait six months. Now I'm over here. On the opposite side of this solar system. 
and I measure the position of that exact same star. What should happen to the position of that star in the sky? It should wiggle. It should wiggle. Look, camera one's way over here, camera two is way over here. I should measure a wiggle in the star. And he did it, and guess what he got? Nothing. Nothing. No wiggle at all. No parallelized measure. So how could it be? If we were to orbit around the sun, we ought to measure a parallax distance to a star? Can't do it. Nobody could. Nobody could. If we are to accept, according to Tycho Brahe, if we are to accept that the Earth revolves around the sun, then the nearest star, the nearest star has to be at least, you ready? 700 times further away than the Saturn. Really? Really? You didn't expect me to buy that? No one could answer. No one. Eventually, the Earth-centered model became fashionable for other reasons, mostly because it made for easier horoscopes. But still, this objection remained. A hundred years went by. Improvements in telescopes, great observatories began to be built all around the world. No one could measure a parallax to a star. Two hundred years ago. No one can measure a parallax to a star. By the early 1800s, astronomers were starting to get a little bit nervous because no one had measured a single distance to a single star, and they'd been working on it for over 200 years. Tycho Brahe's objection still stood. One of the challenges of trying to measure a distance to a star is you're guessing that probably some of the stars are closer to the Earth than others. But which ones? If I see a bright star, is that star bright because it's close? Or bright because it's bright? You can't tell. Which one of these stars is closest to us right now? Nobody knows. Which one, if I have only a limited amount of time and resources to measure distances, which one should I pick? Brightest. Brightest? Maybe. We tried that, couldn't get any measurements, couldn't get any distances. It wasn't the brightest stars that were closest to us, they were just brighter. But by the early 1800s, we had noticed something funny. We had noticed something funny. And this only came about after decades of detailed observations. We had become accustomed to the fact that planets move, but by the early 1800s, we had discovered that stars move too. Huh. Here's a star, Barnard star, discovered by St. Bernard or something. <laughs> so, uh, and you might be tempted to think, oh, wow, Paul, this is a great example of parallax. No, this is not parallax. So this is taken from the exact same vantage point, the exact same time of year, but these pictures were taken 50 years apart. In the 50 years, Barnard's star has moved. The stars are not fixed. The firmament, firmament isn't so firm. Slowly, achingly slowly, over the course of decades, mm. centuries, millennia, the stars shift their positions. And here we have a clue. Nature was getting messy, but she was helping us out. If the stars are moving, maybe this can help us pick out a closer. Because let's assume, let's assume, you know, maybe the stars are moving at roughly the same speed, or statistically there's some average speed. Now I want you to imagine you're standing up against a, a, a freeway full of traffic. And all the cars are moving down the lanes. And there's a bunch of lanes. Some lanes are close to you, some are further away. And all the cars are moving at the exact same speed. And so a car that's closest to you, right up against that inner lane, moving across your field of view, will appear to move across your field of view relatively quickly. While a car that's in that furthest lane going the exact same speed will take longer, will appear to go longer, take longer. To cross your field. Again, it's just a geometry of that. 
So some of the stars appear to move relatively slowly. Some of the stars appear to move relatively quickly. Maybe the ones that are moving quickly might be closer to us. And there's a star here, that one, 61 Cygni, otherwise totally unremarkable, had a nickname in the early 1800s. It was called Piazzi's Flying Star. It had one of the fastest apparent motions on our sky. That was a prime target. Maybe, just maybe, it's a closer star to us. And in 1838, an amateur astronomer, self-taught polymath by the name of Friedrich Bessel, designed and built his own telescope, his own measuring apparatus, measured a distance to 61 Cygni, the flying star. In 200 years after Tycho Brahe raised his objection, Friedrich Bessel, an amateur astronomer, was finally able to measure a parallax distance to a star. And when he went to report his findings, he knew it was a big deal. He knew it was a big deal. This was important. He wanted the public to know about it. But when he looked around at like the units and the words to describe distances, everything came short. So Friedrich Bessel invented a new word to describe how far away this star was. He invented the word light year. The distance light travels in one year. In this star, 61 Cygni, the flying star, is about 10 light years away from the Earth. 10 light years away from the Earth. Now keep in mind, Tycho Brahe paled at the thoughts of the nearest stars being 700 times further away than Saturn. 61 Cygni, one of our nearest neighbors, 10 light years away, is 72,000 times further away than Saturn. It's not our closest neighbor, but it's right down the block. Overnight, overnight, our universe became much, much larger. And over the course of the 1800s, astronomers do what astronomers do best, which is copy other people. And as soon as Bessel demonstrated this method, other astronomers, using the exact same technique, measured distances to star after star after star after star after star. Slowly, painstakingly slowly, building a map of our universe, of distances and positions to stars. And as they grew more sophisticated, they saw all sorts of stars. Different colors and different sizes, different distances. Sometimes they were clumped together, sometimes they weren't. Sometimes they were binaries or triplets, and sometimes they weren't. It was, it was a mess. And tucked in between the stars were these very, very strange things called nebula. It was Greek for cloudy thing. And these nebula came in all sorts of different shapes and sizes and colors and arrangements and structures and patterns. We didn't understand a single thing. One of my favorite references that I read as I was, as I was writing this book was a short pamphlet written in 1903 titled The Past Hundred Years of Astronomy. It was a review for a popular audience. And the summary of this review was look at all the stuff we've learned. We have no idea what's going on. We've measured distances to stars. We've mapped all these nebula. We, we've seen new planets in our solar system and asteroids. Whoa. This, what does it all mean? How are these things connected? We have no idea. And of particular interest, of particular interest, were a special kind of nebula called the spiral nebula. These were very fascinating objects. Very fascinating objects. You can see a spiral nebula with the naked eye. It's in the constellation Andromeda. It's called the Andromeda Nebula. It's pretty big, you know, it's the size of an outstretched fist. Very popular. Here's a photograph of the Andromeda Nebula taken in 1900. And you look at it and you say, wow, what a fascinating object. 
There's a bright, dense core. There's these dark lanes in it. You know, spiral structure. It has some friends hanging out. A bajillion stars. Like, wow. Ah. No, by this time in 1900, we've used the parallax method to measure distances out to 1,000, 5,000 light years, starting to push in 10,000 light years. This was obviously further than 10,000 light years. We couldn't get a parallax measurement to it. What is it? 15,000 light years away? 30,000 light years away? Thankful. We couldn't get a parallax measurement to any star in the Andromeda Nebula, but in a repeat of what went down in the 1800s, the longer we watched the sky, the more interesting it became, the messier it became, and we were able to use some of that messiness to our advantage. Now you remember the old question. If a star is bright, is it bright because it's bright or because it's close? Well, let's, let's do a little experiment. Let's say I wanted you to measure the distance to this phone. Well, if you had parallax measurement, it might be a little bit tricky because the phone's a little bit far away. But let me uh, illuminate the situation. That's an astronomy joke. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you, you guys would be the one to get it. Okay. So I'll turn on the flashlight. Now I don't know. I don't know if anyone in this room has the exact same model of phone that I do. Does anyone have a Samsung Galaxy S7? I know it's been a few years. Any S7s out there? I need to talk about it. Samsung Galaxy S7. I don't know. It only work if you have the exact same model with the exact same phone. Let's pretend you do. And you were to turn on your flashlight. On your phone. Mm -hmm. And you were to hold it, there you go. You were to hold it right in front of your face. Right up there, get up in there. Now, you can measure a distance to that light, right? And you can measure a brightness of that with, you know, a brightometer or something. <laughs> Science, right? <laughs> and you can measure the brightness to this guy here. And you know. This is the exact same flashlight with the exact same model of the exact same phone. You know how bright it ought to be. You can measure the brightness all the way from there. You can do a little bit of trigonometry and you can calculate a distance. This is called a standard camera. Now, unfortunately, Samsung Galaxy S7s are not scattered throughout our universe, despite their names. <laughs> but... <laughs> But nature did give us standard candles. Nature has given us standard candles. And it came in the form of these strange pulsating stars called Cepheid variables. We had known about Cepheid variables for a few decades. And in the early 1800s, a wonderful astronomer by the name of Henrietta Swan Lovett, the only astronomer with an animal for a middle name, Von Pratt, discovered something remarkable about Cepheid variables. She discovered a relationship. Some Cepheid variables pulse very slowly. They take weeks to cycle between bright and dim. And some Cepheid variables pulse very quickly, just a few days between bright and dim. She discovered that the longer it takes for a Cepheid variable to pulse, the brighter it actually is. Regardless of distance. And the shorter it takes to pulse between bright and dim, the dimmer it is, regardless of the distance. Here's a connection. Here's a standard candle. Because you can find a Cepheid variable, you can watch it pulse bright and dim, bright and dim. You can calculate that, turn that into a true brightness, and from there measure a distance. You have found a standard candle in the universe. And it just so happens that this Andromeda Nebula has a few Cepheid variables inside of it. 
And another astronomer, Edwin Hubble, was able to identify a couple dozen Cepheid variables inside the Andromeda Nebula. He's able to watch them go bright and dim. He's able to calculate a distance to them, and therefore able to calculate the distance to the Andromeda Nebula. And he discovered that the Andromeda Nebula is not the Andromeda Nebula, it's the Andromeda Galaxy. It lies two and a half million light years away. And it's our nearest neighbor. Two and a half million light years away. Just a hundred years, less than a hundred years after Friedrich Bessel discovered that one of our nearest neighbor stars is ten light years away, Edwin Hubble ups the game. Overnight, again, overnight, our universe becomes so much bigger. And just like through the 1800s, astronomers built maps of our universe by pinpointing locations to stars. Throughout the 1900s, we built maps of our universe by pinpointing locations to galaxies. Location on the sky, distance, repeat. Again and again. Doing cosmography, the map of the cosmos. It continues today. This work continues today. This is the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the Apache Point, New Mexico. OSU is a major partner in this. It is a galaxy survey, a map maker of the universe. Now I'm going to show you the true scale of our universe as revealed by surveys like this. It's a little bit overwhelming. So we're going to take some baby steps, okay? We're going to start with some familiar large structures in the universe, and we're going to go out from here. So tell me, in this room, does anyone recognize this large structure in the universe? <laughs> has anyone ever been to this shoe? Ever hear of football? Yeah. Hear it's <laughs> There's some overlap. Some overlap. Yeah. yeah, you walk up to the shoe, you walk like, this is a large thing. This is undeniably a large thing, right? Can you still see it? Yeah, this is the North Campus. <coughs> I told you. <coughs> it's a big thing in our universe. Can you still see it? Yeah, yeah there's a little, little baby in a little stadium right there. It's 100,000 people. Can you still see it? <laughs> not, probably not. But you can see Columbus, right? Yeah. Columbus is big. Takes forever to get across, especially on that like tonight. Well, this is big. Cities are large things. We should be proud of ourselves for building such large things. Can you still see Columbus? Mm -hmm. Maybe at night. Maybe at night might be a little easier, yeah. Can you still see Columbus? But hey, planet Earth is big, alright? Don't let anyone tell you differently. We live on a, we live on a big planet. It's the biggest of the rocky planets, huh? huh? That's worth something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Down there. There we are. The sun has blemishes bigger than the earth. The sun is big, right? This is a nebula. Each one of these dots is an entire star. A single nebula holds enough material to manufacture around 10,000 suns. Here's our map of the Milky Way galaxy. We're out here, two-thirds of the way out, on the spur of a spiral arm. Our galaxy is about 100,000 light years across, home to about 300 billion stars. Now what I'm going to show you is a movie. And this movie is actually a, almost 10 years out of date. But no one's made a better movie, so I play it all the time. This is from the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So you're going to see a map of our universe at the time this was made. It's going to start at the Milky Way with our nearest neighbor, Andromeda, and it's going to zoom out. It's going to go bigger. In each one of these little fuzzy patches, each one of these dots, is an entire galaxy home to hundreds of billions of stars. This is not a simulation, this is not a visualization, this is not an animation. This is data. 
These are real galaxies in their real positions in the real universe. This is the structure of our cosmos. 400 years after Tycho Brahe raised his objection of how far away are the stars, by repeatedly asking the question, this is what we get. And we notice something here. We notice something. We notice that galaxies aren't scattered around randomly in our universe. No, there's a structure. There's a pattern. There are long, thin ropes of galaxies. There are dense knots. There are broad walls. There are huge, empty regions we call the Great Voids. Galaxies arrange themselves in a pattern. The largest pattern found in nature. We call it the cosmic web. The cosmic web is made of galaxies the same way your body is made of cells if your cells were a million times small. The largest pattern. We notice something else about these galaxies. We became accustomed to the fact that planets move, and then we became accustomed to the fact that stars move, and then we realized that the galaxies move too. Not only do the galaxies move around randomly, the galaxies move away from each other. Our universe itself is dynamic. Our universe itself changes with time. Our universe itself is evolving. If galaxies are getting further away in time, that means in the past they were closer together. This means that in the past our universe was different. And it means in the future our universe will be different. Our universe ages. You have a birthday? You have an age? Our universe has a birthday. Our universe has an age. You have fond childhood memories? Our universe remembers a time before the first stars were born. You anticipate old age and time and death? Our universe is dying as we speak. It doesn't produce stars as efficiently as it did billions of years ago. Our universe is aging. Our universe is changing. So what are we to make of this? Right, we used to draw comfort from the night sky. Its regularity, its dependability, its repeatability. But the further and further we looked, the more and more it looked like us. It looked unpredictable and chaotic. And messy. And we've been asking questions in the night sky for hundreds of years, and we've started to get some answers. And there weren't the answers we expected, but at least they're answers. What are we supposed to make of it? How are we supposed to grapple with the fact that we now realize that our universe is giant and cold and empty and uncaring? It doesn't care about us. Well, here's something remarkable. Here's something remarkable. The more we learn that the heavens are just like the earth, the more we learn that the earth is just like the heavens. We learn that the physics that we are able to understand, the patterns and structures and laws that govern our lives here on the earth, apply throughout the universe. Physics is universal. Think about it. A hydrogen atom in your drink tonight behaves exactly the same as a hydrogen atom on the opposite side of the Milky Way. The force that pulls an apple from a tree is the exact same gravity that keeps the planets in orbit around the sun. Uh, the electricity that keeps your heart beating is the exact same force that illuminates the cosmos for us to understand. When we look up to the night sky and we ask, where do we belong? 
The answer comes back crystal clear. After 400 years of searching, the answer comes back crystal clear. Right here. Thank you so much for inviting me out tonight. So as Mark mentioned, there was a fortunate snafu with the publisher, so I don't have books no book with me tonight to sell. <laughs> Uh, but so you can find books. It's at Barnes and Noble. It's in Books a Million. It's on Amazon. Anywhere you can find books, uh, or you can go to my website, campsider.com/store/book. You can order an autographed copy. Put in this coupon code for you, uh, and you'll get a discount. So it brings it back down to the normal uh, bookstore price, and then I will ship it out to you autographed as soon as the books come in, which should be mid next week. So by the end of next week, you'll have. And I think we have a little bit of time for some questions, and of course I'll, I'll hang out with you. Yeah. And you mentioned it really, really quickly in your, in your story there. You talked about talk, Tycho Brahe making an observation from his observatory. In my history, I remember that Tycho Brahe was the last astronomer that didn't use a telescope. Mm -hmm. Yes, he did have an observatory, but it did not have a telescope in it. Yes. He used other means of measuring. Yes. Or yeah. yeah, exactly. So Tycho Brahe, this was right on the cusp of the Galilean Revolution. Tycho Brahe was an amazingly meticulous astronomer. He, it was the Naked Eye Astronomer. It was the Naked Eye Observatory, full of all sorts of giant machines and winches and things to very, very accurately measure positions as best he could with the naked eye. Yeah. So even that limited his parallax measurements, mm -hmm. But even after the development of the telescope, we still couldn't get a parallax measure. Mm -hmm. So it was a Uranibor was the name of his fortress of science outside of Copenhagen. Basically, our like pointed his early telescope was basically lenses suspended from a, a rod. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, where are we now on big balance versus no big balance for the uh, expanding universe? So when it comes to the expansion of the universe, and, and this is the topic I cover in the book, is all the things we currently don't understand. Uh, something we discovered about 20 years ago is that not only is our universe expanding, but the expansion of the universe is accelerating. So not only does the universe get bigger every day, it gets bigger and bigger, faster and faster every day. We have no idea what's going on. We call this dark energy. It's a cool name. We don't understand it. We observe it. We know it's there, but we don't understand it. It's, as far as we can tell, our universe will continue to expand indefinitely. That may change. <laughs> so my big question has always been, then the fabric of the universe itself is sort of stretching out and uh, it doesn't seem to have any minimum, you know, uh, unit to it. Right, so this is a very, very good question. We use uh, about the fabric of the universe, and, and if the universe is expanding, this fabric is stretching out, can it just, it stretch in for, forever. So we use this phrase, we use this phrase, fabric of space-time. Mm -hmm. It's a very poetic phrase, it's a very colorful phrase. Don't... Try not to let colorful metaphors, as useful as they are for visualizing things, if you start to have questions about the metaphor itself, or the words, the English language words we use, then that means the English language is not up to the test. Physics is a mathematical description of this is how we build our understanding is through the mathematics. We put English language words on top of it so we can you know, talk about it and visualize it. When we say our universe is expanding, all that means, all that means, the mathematics and the observations and the theory of general relativity, all that means is that the distances between galaxies grows with time. That's all it means. And that's what we mean when we live in an expanding universe. On average, statistically, the distances between all galaxies grows with time. That's it. That's it. 
One other thing was a, a slide you used to talk about the expansion of um, the universe and how fast it's expanding, it's accelerating. Was uh, they just used one side of the Big Bang, right? The Big Bang would have been spherical, so all the galaxies are moving away from the center point at the speed of light. But they're, yeah, that one. So that's just using one one direction, basically, right? The Big Bang would have caused everything to move, you know, in all directions. Right, so the Big Bang, the Big Bang, is not a point in space. It's not a location from which all else expanded. It was not an explosion. The Big Bang was a point in time. The Big Bang happened right here in this room. The Big Bang happened in the Andromeda Galaxy. The Big Bang happened at the edge of the observable universe, all simultaneously. It is a common point in the past for every single point in the universe. We all can identify this age, 13.8, this slide's a little out of date. 13.77 billion years ago, the entire observable universe, which is currently 92 billion light years across, that entire observable universe was the size of a peach and had a temperature of a quadrillion degrees. That is what we call the Big Bang. And we can all point to that common reference point in our past. That is what we mean. Good question. Yeah. The quantum fluctuation that you mentioned, did it happen only once? Is it, it happening as we speak now? <laughs> yeah, good question. So this is a little bit ambiguous. There should be like a little question mark there next to quantum fluctuations. So quantum fluctuations, are we know this happens in the vacuum of space. If you remove all particles, all photons, everything from a box, you have 100% pure vacuum, there will be some fuzziness in there. There will be some tones in there. There will seem to be some percolation in there. We call these vacuum fluctuations or quantum fluctuations. We know these exist. And we think, we think very, very early in the universe, these quantum fluctuations played a very, very big role, a very important role in seeding the initial structures that would eventually grow up to become things like stars and galaxies and the cosmic web. Did this happen once? Is our universe the one and only? Is our universe one of a chain of such universes, of such Big Bang quantum fluctuation events? If we wait long enough into the distant, distant, distant future, will random pockets of the universe percolate and rock it? We don't know. We honestly don't know. That's under active investigation. Yeah. Why did it take so long for the steady state guys to hold on to their theory yeah. after how long? I mean, uh, the British, I can't remember the British guy's name. Right, so uh, oh, yeah. when, what so after Edwin, Hubble oh, yeah. that, after Edwin Hubble discovered that, after Edwin Hubble discovered that galaxies are moving away from each other on average, there are a few conclusions that you can make. One is just a trick of the light that was rejected pretty, pretty early on based on some very detailed observations. Two, there's something like the Big Bang. Or three, there's something that's called steady state where instead of the universe being born at a finite point in the past, the universe has always been around, always has existed, and matter is continuously created, and as the universe continually expands. So it's been in this state forever. That's called steady state. In order to tell the difference, you need to go past just the fact that galaxies move. Because that is a consequence of both theories. So you need some more observations. You need decades of observation. And two key pieces of evidence came along to point to the Big Bang picture and disfavor the steady state picture. One is once we started to build radio telescopes, we identified it a new kind of object called a quasar, a very loud radio source in our universe. In the quasars, were only far away. They were only far away. There are no nearby quasars. These loud radio galaxies are only far away. They're not close. In the Big Bang Theory, this is just fine. Because in the Big Bang Theory, the universe was different in the past 
And the further out you go, the further back in time you're looking. So yeah, things can be different back then than they are today. In the steady state model, this is a challenge because the universe has always been in the exact same state for eternity. It shouldn't look any different the further away you go. And then in the 1950s, the big piece, the big piece came with the discovery of this thing right here called the cosmic microwave background. Cosmic microwave background is leftover relic fossil radiation from when the universe was just 380,000 years old. In the steady state model, that shouldn't exist. In the Big Bang model, it was predicted to exist. So until you got those observations, remember, this is, Edwin Hubble is like 1920s, cosmic microwave background is 1950s. We're somewhat busy with a world war at the time. It wasn't verified to the, uh, the cosmic microwave background, it was, it was detected, for sure, in 1956. Um, yes. So Hoyle had a way of creating matter still with the steady state? Yeah, I mean, technically a lot of matter gets created either way. It, all ha it either happens at once, it happening, so. or it just keeps happening slowly. It's a modification to general relativity to allow... Uh, okay. Vanilla general relativity can give you Big Bang. One little modification of the equations give you, gives you steady state. Yeah, go ahead. I heard that Stephen Hawking say gravity is a consequence of identity, so does it mean string, string theory is the accepted model? No. So when it comes to th things like string theory, you may have heard of string theory, M theory, super strings, all this kind of stuff. Actually, string theory is on very observation, experimental. And the challenge to this, the challenge to string theory, so we haven't tested string theory directly, of course, but we have what we call the standard model of physics. This is our model of particle interactions at a fundamental level. And we are trying to build extensions to it. We're trying to go past that standard model. We're trying to understand new and deeper physics. One of the first layers you can add to it, at first extensions, is something called supersymmetry. It's a family of theories that connect some fundamental interactions. You, we have the capability to test supersymmetry. If supersymmetry is true or experimentally verified, then you can continue building on and go off in a few different directions. One of those directions is string theory. But in order for string theory to be right, supersymmetry has to be correct. Supersymmetry has been ruled out by experiment over the past 10 years with the Large Hadron Collider. Because supersymmetry predicts new, the existence of new particles at certain energies, we haven't seen a single one. So supersymmetry is slowly, and now quite rapidly, being wiped off the map. Without supersymmetry, you can't get to string theory. You can't even go down that road. Mild crisis. Mild crisis in the particle physics world. Quantum gravity. <laughs> Uh, loop quantum gravity isn't working out so well either. So, when you're talking about like the further we look, you see quasars. Mm -hmm. Is there like a ratio, or do you see like the ratio between a quasar and galaxies, you know, shifting? Like, you get, you get so far out, you see a lot more quasars, you get really far out, it's mostly quasars. Right, that's a very, very good question. We don't have comprehensive enough surveys to actually determine that kind of ratio. The nearest quasar is 150 million light years away from the Earth, if I remember right, somewhere around there. So you see, if, if we're looking from the Earth vantage point of the Earth, there's no quasars, no quasars, a few quasars, a few quasars, and then when you're in this ballpark about nine billion years ago, when there's a lot of galaxy mergers, when there's a lot of activity, when star formation is at its peak, that's when you see a lot of quasars. And then when you push back further, even further, the quasars start to die off again because there simply haven't been enough galaxies around long enough to build them. Okay, so, so there's, a little, there's a little peak. Okay, so, so it's like as gravity, as things get closer or things get created, Quasars are kind of like a result of like galaxies banging into each other. Exactly. We're pretty sure. We're not 100% sure of this picture. We think quasar, radio loud galaxy, is the end product of when two galaxies merge. Okay. And then another question are we seeing any kind of relationship to 
the uh, different temperatures in the background uh, uh, microwave uh, radiation uh, versus like current stru large structures. That have. That's a good question. So you see structures here, you see little bumps and wiggles in this background radiation, and you see structures here, bumps and wiggles in the arrangement of galaxies. There's not going to be a connection between these two, but there is a small connection which I'll get to. But you're not going to see a connection because these galaxies are right here in our neighborhood. The light we see from the cosmic microwave background is from a different neighborhood in the universe. Yeah. It's from way over there. That is just now reaching us 13.8 billion years later. They eventually do grow up into galaxies, but galaxies that we can't see yet. No. We'll never see. There is a connection though because the light, a small, small, small connection, when a photon, when a bit of light gets emitted, it passes through all this junk to get to us, and there's gravitational lensing, there's heating and cooling of the light as it passes through different structures. So we can use that, we can actually look for this subtle, very, very subtle signal to measure the total amount of structure between us and the cosmic microwave background. The, the scale of the, the bumps in the cosmic micro, microwave background is roughly analogous to the scale, or at least in terms of the evolution of the universe, roughly analogous to the scale of the of the cavities and, and, and walls in the current universe? There's, there's two major scales. There's actually quite a bit of fluctuations in this cosmic microwave background. There's big patches that are about 10 degrees across. These are actually due to sound waves crashing around in the very early universe, something we call baryon acoustic oscillations, because that sounds awesome. <laughs> and then there's a bunch of very, very small, about one degree scale bumps and wiggles, those uh, will eventually grow to become the galaxies and clusters of galaxies. They're much, much smaller at this epoch, both in, in angular size and in density, but they are the seeds of future structures. Yes. Maybe that could be like if, uh, that quantum fluctuation, maybe that's like a reflection. It is. Excellent, excellent point. This cosmic microwave background, is our window into the early universe. And the fact that we can say this word, quantum fluctuations, with any degree of certainty is that we understand the statistics of quantum fluctuations, because we can do this in a laboratory, we have, and then we can evolve it through 380,000 years of cosmic evolution, and we can predict, not the exact bumps and wiggles, but we can predict the statistics and it's exactly what we predict from quantum theory. What's the current status? Uh, there's some observations of the microwave and some directionality of the universe that was quite a controversy. Where does that sit right now? Right, so this measurement, uh, so the cosmic microwave background was measured with a few missions starting in the early 90s right. with the COBE mission, uh, mid 2000s with WMAP, and most recently with Planck. Planck satellite, I was a member of the Planck collaboration, and we did notice some odd features. One of the odd features that we noticed in our maps, that were hinted at in the earlier maps and then confirmed with our observations, is that when you look north in our solar system, the top half of our solar system, the cosmic microwave background is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit warmer than the south which should not be a thing. The cosmic microwave background was generated for 13.8 billion years ago. It shouldn't care about our the orientation of our solar system at all. And we checked all the things like, is it micrometeorite dust? Is it our plasma bubble in the galaxy? We can't eliminate it. It's there in the data. We're not exactly sure what it is. Doesn't it propose a, a direction towards somewhere in the southern hemisphere? There, there's one, there's, there, that's, so one of the strange things we've noticed is this anisotropy that lines up with the solar system. There's another strange feature, which is uh, when you break down the sky, this cosmic microwave background sky, into different substructures called the octopole and the quadrupole. I know I'm throwing jargon out, but just run with me here. These different breakdowns of the sky should be totally separate. They shouldn't care about each other. 
but two of them line up with each other, and those line up with our solar system. We call this the axis of evil. <laughs> and we don't understand. We just build a wall. I think we have time for a couple more questions. Is there, what are the, good, the working hypotheses on dark matter? Just say, well, well, let's try this, this, and this. Right, our best guess, the only guess we could, like, back in the 70s and 80s when we were first starting to understand and recognize dark matter, there were plenty of theories, plenty of ideas. There's really only one contender left standing, which is that dark matter is made of some new kind of particle that doesn't interact with light. <laughs> so most likely there's dark matter swimming through this room right now. But it doesn't interact with the electromagnetic force, so we don't notice it. We only notice it at very large scales through its gravity. That's the only remaining contender. I read an interesting article about a, sort of a possible way to investigate that using minerals uh, from Earth's mantle and looking for past interactions um, within the crystals of, say, all of them. Um, and basically looking for interactions uh, caused by interaction with the dark matter, basically making a little imperfection in the crystal. And of course they have to rule out all sorts of other Lots of systematics. <laughs> but, yeah. but it's sometimes it's just just right for sure. That's, that's new age physics, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's all in the crystals. <laughs> okay, very last question. Did you mention the current size of the universe is 92 billion light years? The current size of the observable universe is 92 billion light years across. What do you measure that? Is it any relation to the 37.57 billion years of expansion? Right, so uh, when, I, when I give you a size of the universe, this is taking the motions of the most distant galaxies that we can observe, the known age of the universe, 13.8 billion years, the known contents of the universe, regular matter, dark matter, dark energy, Putting it all into a soup that we of, of general relativity, using that to construct a cosmological model of its evolution, and popping out a number of its current size. So that is a model-based number. That number will change as we better understand the universe. But our observable universe is really a small portion as compared to the dark energy projected in dark matter. Perhaps. So. When I say observable universe, I mean the bubble, the limit of what we can see based on the current yeah. age of the universe. Right. But even that is a small, small portion of the entire universe. On that note, let's thank Paul again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.